Hello, everybody. This is Sunday Sermon. I started just calling these Sunday Sermons. Um, I wanted to, I didn't listen to the Catholic verses or uh, review them, so I'm not even sure what they taught this Sunday. For my Catholic friends that it, maybe go check and maybe it'll have something to do with what I'm speaking on today, but I decided instead, uh, being I read Luke chapter 1, I figured I'll talk on that. And I didn't want to start a whole new study on another gospel because I already did the Gospel of John, a whole study, and also uh, Mark. And I've been commenting on Matthew. So I just, and I was delaying to read Luke 1 because I have a few other readings I do during the week. And uh, the other day I said, well, no, I kind of felt like, no, read Luke 1. And it fit in, I, it would be hard for me to explain how it fit in with my conversations with some of my friends on the street. And there just been too many uh, things. Uh, some, I used to mention them on the little rollout videos, like, you know, today I saw this one. But uh, just to say it this way, a lot of the uh, friends that I, I talked to, and of course they're on the street, and they're going through a lot of problems, but both the friends and then when I'm talking to them, uh, they'll say, that verse I was just thinking of, meaning I might quote something. And then my other friend, Austin or Big Charlie, they'll say, they'll bring something up and I'll tell them, I just read that chapter last night. Look, there's a lot of chapters in the Bible and for one of your friends to on the street to just bring up a chapter or a verse and I had just read it, it's really a confirmation how that, and it happens a lot with a couple of my friends. So I might try to mention a few of those, some of the verses that they were speaking about and some of the things it takes too long for me to uh, do them all. And it would be hard because you'd, I'd have to explain everything. Let me do this one, okay? Uh, when my friend Austin comes to visit me, and his name on the street is Trouble, but I had a good talk with Trouble Austin the last couple days, and some of my friends, they'll have all types of different books, and some of the books, as Christians, we consider forbidden books. Others that they look at are not in the New Testament, but they're not considered, quote, forbidden. Now, I've taught that early on. The Epistle of Barnabas, these were early writings that some Christians, and there are a particular group of Christians, I think they're the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, and they have, I think, the Epistle of Barnabas, one of the early letters written at the time of the Bible being put together. I think they still have that book in one of their Bibles. But Christian Bible has... The, we all agree on the books that are in there. Now, so some early writings were rejected because they were either not considered to be written by an apostle or written by somebody that knew the apostles. And then some of the books were rejected because they were out and out what we call spurious, just fake stuff, you know. And so in all of that category, sometimes we say apocryphal works or Gnostic works. In those categories, they were rooted out. They didn't make it into our Bibles. Okay, so in all of these different writings, I do have friends that they'll have some of these books. And Austin uh, is one of them, and he will say, John, I have this one. And a few times Austin was over at my house for little fellowships. He saw that. I said, Austin, I have some of the earlier books because I teach on them, and I don't teach on them as Bible, but I teach on them as history. If you take a course, like in a university, on the early <coughs> writings, uh, people, scholars will cover those. Bart Ehrman, kind of famous scholar, they cover some of these other books, all right? But I, I found it funny that uh, my friend Austin, he would ask me, he'd say, he'd say, John, I think you you know, you practice some of these other, like, things from these other books. And I'd assure Austin, I'd say, no, no, Austin. I said, I just, the Bible, and 
my little area in my yard where I had built all these little patios and I burn candles and incense when I pray. And Austin used to ask me, he said, did you light your candles this morning, John? You know, when you prayed, when he comes over. I said, yes, I light these candles in my little prayer room. I have an area where I light my candles. I said, did, and why do you do that? I said, well, in scripture, we have incense, we have candles. And some of my little patios in my yard that some of you saw that I built these areas uh, a few years back, as I started, like, without any plan, I made these little porches out of granite and these little walkways. And all of that is sanctified as a prayer garden for me. And one year when I was building them, I said, well, I'm going to build one here, and I'm just going to... And then I was teaching through, I think, the book of Ezekiel. I forget now exactly. But one of the books I was teaching out of uh, it talked about how Solomon built the temple and he had all these decks and porches. And I realized as I was building these granite things and making videos, I said, isn't that funny? I said, M some of the blueprint of Solomon's temple and his porches and all, I said, I didn't realize it, but I kind of like followed along with, and this is all like images of the kingdom. And well, then I finally realized why Austin would ask me, like, are you following some of the other books and all? Because I was with Austin, uh, as a matter of fact, I was with Austin Trouble the other day, and I told him, I said, hung out with him for a few hours, you know, and I like hanging out with Austin. But he has, like, a reputation on the street, and he's uh, so sometimes people kind of avoid him, and so it's good for some of my other friends to see me just on the street hanging out with him. And I said, my son-in-law is going to come by and meet me because I bought some carpet from Anthony, which is yeah. Bethany's husband, Anthony. And uh, he's asking me, and, uh, you know, and, uh, so what does he do, John? And, and Austin's paranoid, like some of my other friends, for various reasons. I said, no, he's got a company that's called Anthony's Flooring. I said, it's even written on the side of his truck. And so I know he's paranoid. Sure enough, Anthony pulled right up to the bank where I'm hanging out with my friend Austin. I said, as a matter of fact, that's his truck. It says Anthony's floor. So I kind of walked up. Uh, but then I realized he's got these other books, like I mentioned, all right? Now, I don't condone some of the books that my friends have. But one of the books he has, that somehow somebody gave it to him or whatever, these are books that talk about, I forget, one of them might be called uh, The Wisdom of Solomon. <coughs> Now, some groups, which are actually occult groups, which are forbidden for Christians, what they have done, I've not read these books, but what they have done is they've mixed in what we refer to as, quote, white magic. There's no such thing as white magic. But in the world of spirituality and so forth, and some of my friends, when they're in those other things, I, I see that they're dabbling in things. But he has one book, and I think it was called The Wisdom of Solomon or whatever it was, but this is not a Christian book at all, and uh, we don't recommend those. But then he's showing me like various things that he says, you know, we can use these things, John, and I don't condone it, all right? But then as he's showing me in one of the books, it's like a layout of a building like a deck and a porch and candles and all. And as he's shown it to me, I said, isn't that funny? Not that I agreed with it. I said, but as I'm looking at it, I said, that's what I built, Austin, in my yard. That's why he's been asking me, like, uh, I think you're following these other practices. But I told him right away, I said, but I got all that from the Bible. You know, when I was just building some of my little patios and all, I said, that the, I just realized later this was some of Solomon's wisdom when he was building. And so I think it was a good example because I did not get any of my patterns or prayers or anything from any other source but the Bible. And that's why he would be asking me, like, I think you're, and I would always tell him, no, I, just anything that you see me incorporate comes right out of Scripture. So in a way, it was a good example for him to have seen that my uh, way of praying and the things of incense and all didn't have to come from anything else. 
And that book, I think it was called The Wisdom of Solomon, it, it tries to include sort of like things of white magic and so forth. And I think it would, it's good for Austin to see that we have the real. We don't have to go to any, you know, sort of like copy of a thing. We have the real thing, okay? And so I, I, that was kind of interesting to see that little experience and then to have uh, some of my friends to see, man, John's just, you know, getting from Scripture. I used to pray in my prayer time regularly. Uh, part of my prayer time was, and let me have the wisdom of Solomon, simply because Jesus in the gospel talks about the wisdom of Solomon, which was a king that God gave wisdom to. And so I would pray in my prayer time for many years at a certain time, I'd say, and now I pray for the wisdom of Solomon and the anointing of the Spirit. And then finally I changed it one year. I said, no, I pray for the wisdom of Jesus and the anointing of the Holy Spirit. And But I did pray for uh, the gift because God gave Solomon the gift of wisdom, and he's known for that in the Bible. And so the Scripture says in the letter of James, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of all God. Let him ask of God that gives to all men liberally and upbraideth not. So the prayer for wisdom is an important thing. But we as Christians, we don't access any of these other sources, okay? We simply access Scripture and going right to the throne of God, all right? And But that would be one. There's a few other interesting things I can mention. I want to do a little bit of Luke chapter 1 and then possibly hit on the verses from Church Unlimited. I'll, I'll just mention and show you the little outline. When I'm in Church Unlimited, I quickly write the outline. It doesn't take me long. For instance, uh, Bill had John chapter 3, verse 16, which is very famous. We all know it. I did, so I'll write on my notes. I'll say, okay, add John 3, add my commentary on John. Then I'll write, he meant, uh, also spoke from another, one of the other books, Malachi and all. And if I have a commentary already written and video linked already, I just write, add my commentary, add my links, and it only takes me 15 minutes to finish that whole section of the weekly post. Now, I bring that up to say this. Uh, there are many verses, um, a few that I was writing down recently. There is treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise, but a foolish man spendeth it up. Okay, treasure to be desired and oil in the dwelling of the wise. Wisdom builds the house, and understanding establishes it. And through knowledge, its chambers are filled with all pleasant and precious riches. Now, Jesus gives a parable in the New Testament, one of the famous parables. And there was these uh, people that had lamps, the ten virgins, I believe is the parable. And in the story he's telling, it says, all of these ten virgins had these oil lamps, okay? Back in those days, that's sort of like we have lamps today. But a lamp is what? A lamp is a vessel that puts out, uh, you light it, and it puts out a light, and of course it burns the oil in the lamp. Now, which is a type of the oil of the Holy Spirit, and that we as believers uh, have the Spirit of God in us. We have teaching, we have wisdom, things God gives to us. But then in the parable, Jesus said that these five virgins were wise and five of the virgins were foolish. And the wise virgins, now this, I won't teach the whole meaning behind the parable, but the wise virgins, when it was time for the wedding and come and the wedding is ready and it's like a parable on being prepared when the bridegroom comes, Jesus is the bridegroom, we are the bride of Christ. It says, but these, they all had lamps and they all had uh, a fire. But some had the lamps and, and had the oil. They had the preparation. They had a storehouse. Others did not. And so the lamps burned for a little bit and then they ran out of oil. And then they said to the five wise virgins, give us some oil. You, made, you didn't just have the lamp, but you had a storehouse. 
And they said, oh, no, we, we're not going to give you any oil. Go and buy some yourself. And then when they went to buy the oil, the bridegroom came. And the lamps were ready for those that were prepared. Now, the principle in these few verses I quoted is this. We have in our day, you see me speaking on a, uh, I'm making this on a very simple phone camera. We have in our day all types of lamps. We have in our day all types of vehicles to communicate. And a lot of people, not to be too critical, but whether it's Facebook, whether it's a video camera, whatever it is, a lot of times uh, people in our day, in our connected online society, people have accessed all these lamps, you see, all these instruments that, and a lot of it is just used for stuff that's not really worth anything, okay? And that's why I don't want to criticize all my Facebook friends. But, you know, maybe we have these great tools in our day, but there seems to be maybe no value or very little value to a lot of the ways people are using them. And sometimes even on Christian websites, I'll check other ones. Some are just set up just to kind of advertise a church meeting or advertise a particular thing. And I would encourage, if you write an outline for your church, uh, some churches do this, you spend all the time writing the outline or doing have a whole section where people could read, that where there's a storehouse, if you will, meaning you've taught, you've written, you've and get that out, communicate that. Uh, uh, internet and online and videos and all, these are not just tools to advertise for people to come to a meeting, okay? That's a paradigm that I think should be changed, okay? And the letters that we read right now, when we read the Bible, they were written by primarily by the Apostle Paul, but the other letters I'll try to get to Luke in a second. These were people living in the first century in a day where we did have the ability to write, and but it was uh, difficult, you know, everybody didn't have the tools to actually write and then to communicate. And you didn't have printing press and a lot of other things that were invented much later on. But yet what they did, when you read the letters in the New Testament and Paul's writing something, the picture of all Paul wrote was, I'm going to be at Corinth, I'm going to be at Ephesus, I'm going to come to a certain city and I'm going to speak next Sunday. And, I, and imagine in the letter, if you opened it up and read the letter to the Galatians or whatever, and all you read was, come meet me, because I'm going to speak next Sabbath somewhere, whatever. What value would that letter be 2,000 years later? N not much. What value would it be if Paul spoke that Sunday and it was not, re it was not written down? It was not uh, recorded. If he just spoke it, and it was great, and everybody listened to Paul, and then the next week he spoke, so, and we had no record of it. The New Testament is a collection of the writings that the teachers, the apostles, the others that wrote, felt the purpose of writing is to communicate the message. The purpose of a website or a camera or whatever is to communicate. And, it, and, and it's really of little value if we have all these oil lamps, we have all these great tools in our day to communicate and that we're just wasting it. So I would just encourage, I'll just say that as a note, I would just encourage every church, every minister, every Christian, remember, you have a, you have a great opportunity to get the message out through all these things that we have in our day. But have oil in the lamp. Have some type of a storehouse where you're communicating that something that could be effective. If somebody picks up and watches something that you post online in a year from now, don't let it just be an invitation to maybe you're doing a teaching Sunday. Come Sunday at a certain... No, no. Load that thing with wisdom. Load that blog, pastors. Your website, Just it's not just a billboard to invite people to a church service. It is a billboard that goes out into all the earth, potentially, by being online, and communicate. Paul and the others in the first century, as difficult it was for them, they didn't have any of these tools, they were writing that down, 
They were sending it hand to hand. They'd go to the letters, were going to different churches, and they would pass them around. People would read them. That's why we have them in our Bibles today, because they felt like it was uh, uh, the tool that they were given, the ability to, in a very simple, primitive way to write. We had papyrus and ways that, you know, writing paper wasn't like you have today. You go on, but yet they were disciplined. So that's what I would say. I, I would just encourage you. Uh, have some oil in that lamp, you see. Have some value in whatever it is you're posting, whatever it is, have some value. All right, let me do a little bit on Luke. I'll add, I'll add the verses that Bill spoke about. Uh, but in Luke 1, it's a long chapter. I think it's 80 verses, so it's kind of long. But some of the friends of mine were talking about God chose us. God, before we were born, he picked us and the importance of names. And that's really what you get in Luke 1. Luke 1, uh, Luke wrote the book of Acts, and he wrote the Gospel of Luke. And right in the beginning of Luke chapter 1, he says, As many have taken up the task to write about all of the things about Jesus and about what happened in our day, first century, he said, Luke says, I myself, having perfect understanding from the beginning, thought it would be good for me to put everything in order. As a matter of fact, that's what I'm talking about. Luke said, a lot has happened in our day with Jesus, with the movement. Luke himself was a companion of the Apostle Paul in the book of Acts, and that's why Luke, as a historian as well as a physician, wrote the book of Acts. I'll be done with that in one more teaching. But Luke says, so I'm going to put it all in order, one of the themes of Luke 1, as I talk about it right now, will be order. And he says, I'm going to put it down. So it's, he's writing it to a man by the name of Theophilus. It's the same man he wrote the book of Acts. And the same person, if you read the beginning of Acts and the beginning of Luke. Uh, who this man was, we're not really sure, but it was an important man in the early days. And that, that letter, it's addressed to this man. He says, and I'm going to document everything. All right, then he begins in order, writing, documenting. There was in the days of Zacharias and Elizabeth. This is early on in the first century. You had a king by the name of Herod the Great, which I talked about a lot. And Luke says there was this man. Now, he was a priest in the order of priests, which was the way the Old Testament had priests. And his name was Zacharias. And Zacharias' wife was Elizabeth. And it says they were older people, but they were serving God. They were both righteous before God, but yet Elizabeth was barren. Elizabeth had no children. But Zacharias, in his service to God, in his order, it says, as he fulfilled everything that God told him to do, one day he goes into the temple to offer incense, to do what God called him to do. And as he went into the temple, it says all the people were outside praying. And this was a regular orderly course in his service to God. And it said there appeared by the altar an angel. And this angel is the angel Gabriel. And it scares Zacharias. It's frightened. And the angel says to Zacharias, your prayers are heard. And your wife, Elizabeth, she's going to have a son. And the angel says the name. It happens to be my name. But the angel says, and this boy is going to be named John. And, and this son, which is John the Baptist, is going to, uh, it's a great calling. It's going to be, it's not just an average boy. I'll talk about him a little bit as I talk on this chapter. Now, when Zacharias in his service to God in the temple, has this experience. He asks the angel, which is Gabriel, and he says, but we are old. How is this possible? How can this thing be? And the angel says, I'm Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God, and I brought this message to you. But because you're that doubting it, because he was doubting it, he says, you're not going to be able to speak until the day that these words come to pass, until the day that John, 
is going to be born. Now, this is John the Baptist. Now, he was in the temple longer than normal, and the people outside were kind of getting a little worried. Back in those days, if a priest kind of messed up, they used to put little bells on the robes of the priests. And what were the bells for? Well, the bells were if you were outside and you're listening to the priest in the temple and you're hearing the bells uh, jingle, what did that mean? It meant he was alive. He was still doing a service. But why'd they have the bells? Because if he did something wrong in the presence of God, he might get struck dead. And then you're not hearing the bells for a while, and you could be thinking, uh-oh, the priest messed up, because, like, you're listening to maybe a dog bell or something. Jeez. But he was in there, and that's where they were maybe getting a little worried. But he, he was in there longer than usual, because Gabriel, the angel, appeared to him. Now, when he comes out of the temple, he can't speak. Because that's the judgment. The angel said, you're not going to be able to speak until these words come to pass, because you're doubting it. And they realized something must have happened. Okay, the promise was what? You're going to have a son. Your wife, Elizabeth, is going to get pregnant. Sure enough, Elizabeth does get pregnant. And there are things that she says in this chapter, Luke 1, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, too, will speak in this chapter. And even Zacharias, the father of John, and I would just encourage you all in the chapter of this teaching, uh, read those things, those praises, because all of them are centered around God's now done a great thing. We refer to the words of Mary as Mary's Magnificat. Okay, I might mention a little bit of that in a second. All right, so now Elizabeth gets pregnant, and it's she's six months pregnant. And she says, look at what God has done. He's looked upon me. He's taken away my reproach. I've, all these years I've waited for a son. And it's a supernatural event. Now, the same angel in this chapter by the name of Gabriel goes to a city in Galilee by the name of Nazareth. And he appears to a virgin by the name of Mary, who's engaged, espoused to a man by the name of Joseph. And the angel says to Mary, you are highly favored. The Holy Spirit's going to come upon you. And you're going to give birth to, it says, that holy thing, that child that you're going to give birth to is going to be called the son of the highest. And, you're going to, and his name is going to be Jesus. Now notice, the angel is giving another name before the birth of the child. Jesus means... God is salvation. Yahweh is salvation. John's name, John means, I've heard different things. John means the beloved, but uh, John is, talks about like favor as well. I'll add the little definitions to these names. But now when Mary gets this message from Gabriel, she's going to give birth to Jesus, to the Messiah. The difference here is she's a virgin, okay? John the Baptist was born the normal way but it was not miraculous in a virgin birth, but it was miraculous in the sense that Elizabeth was barren and she didn't have children all those years. And then she has a child when she's old. But this one's different. And the angel also says, it gives the report to Mary, that your cousin Elizabeth, by the way, is also pregnant. And we just cover that. Now, Mary questions the angel not in doubt, like Zecharias, but she does say, how can this be, being I know not a man, being she was a virgin, and she was engaged to Joseph, but they, have, they did not sleep together yet. And that's why the angel says, the Holy Spirit is going to come upon you, and that way the child that you're going to have is going to be called the son of the highest. John the Baptist is a prophet that was prophesied of by the prophet Malachi, but Jesus is the Son of God, okay? That's the distinction. All right, now Mary believes the message, and it's miraculous as well. She goes and visits her cousin. Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. So she decides, this is quite amazing, all that's happening, 
she decides to go visit her cousin Elizabeth, who is at this point about six months pregnant. And as soon as she greets Elizabeth, and obviously they're going to discuss, can you believe what's happening? First of all, the angel Gabriel appeared to Elizabeth's husband, and now the same angel appeared to Mary. And as soon as uh, Elizabeth hears the voice of Mary, who is now just conceived supernaturally, with Jesus, pregnant with Jesus by the miracle of God, Elizabeth six months pregnant with John the Baptist, and as soon as Elizabeth hears the voice of Mary, the Bible says, the babe, John the Baptist, leaped in her womb, and the mother Elizabeth spoke out loudly, prophesied, because the Spirit of God that's on John, because it says, He's going to be filled with the Spirit from his mother's womb. John the Baptist says his calling is a prophet, and the Spirit of God is on him right from the start. And so Elizabeth prophesies, and she, oh, the mother of my Lord would come to see me, because Jesus now has been conceived supernaturally. And Mary and Elizabeth discuss and say, isn't this amazing? And then Mary gives what's called Mary's Magnificat, okay? This is like a whole particular type of a praise that she gives. And she says, God's uh, look down. He's, take, he's dethroned the powerful from their seats, and he's lifted up the lowly. He's put down the rich, and he's, he's looked upon the plight of the poor. And, and if you read this praise that Mary gives... It's like a prophecy, it's called Mary's Magnificat, that through God heard the prayers of the people that were oppressed. They were waiting all these years for a deliverer to come, and she herself is going to give birth to Jesus Christ. And then the father of, uh, of John the Baptist also gives like a wonderful praise and talks about Jesus in his Prophecy says, God has raised us a horn of salvation in the house of David, and his own son, Zechariah's own son, which is John the Baptist, is the prophet of the Most High, prophesied in the book of Malachi. Now, Bill actually had a verse from Malachi, chapter 3, in his message today, but it was talking about bring all the tithes into the storehouse. But the prophecy of John is in Malachi 4, and it says, before that great notable day of the Lord, I will send this uh, Elijah. And he's going to be the forerunner of Jesus. And that was a prophecy fulfilled by John the Baptist who came in the power and the spirit of Elijah. So at the end of the chapter, it says John the Baptist was lived out in the wilderness until the days of his appearing. And John comes and hits the scene as a radical prophet who is the forerunner of Jesus Christ. And it says in that chapter of Luke 1, it says, and all the word got out into the hill country. That's actually what it says. And they said, some amazing things are beginning to happen. Because this was a time of the fulfillment of all the Old Testament prophets. And John the Baptist is the last prophet that comes in the line of these Old Testament radical prophets. And Jesus himself says of John, among those that were born of women, there's none greater than John the Baptist. But nevertheless, he that is least in the kingdom is greater than John. So John, uh, Jesus himself testifies about John the Baptist. We've talked about John recently. But the supernatural element of the naming of the children, and they were surprised in, in the naming of, we didn't get to the birth of Jesus yet, not in Luke chapter 1, but we did get to the birth of John. And when they named him John, because Zacharias was dumb, he could not speak, it actually says in this chapter that because he was dumb or unable to speak for a while, and when Elizabeth said, we're going to name him John, all the people, John was not a common name. Today it's a common name because of primarily the story all these years later. But at that time they said, John, why are you going to name him John? There's no one in your family named John. And that's when Zacharias' lips were open. But it says they made signs to him 
how he should be named. Why did they make sign, like they use sign language? Because a lot of people associated the inability to speak with the inability to hear. Because back in those days, and even in our day, if somebody has a very bad hearing problem, they often have a speech impediment. That's just a common thing. But it says they made signs to Zacharias, and I wonder if Zacharias was like saying, look, I'm not deaf, I, mm -hmm. just, can't, I just can't speak. And so as soon as he spoke, uh, he actually wrote it down. It said they brought a writing tablet to him. It actually, what was a writing tablet like then? A rock? Well, it was like a thing of wax, okay? Oh. And you could engrave in the wax, so you didn't have the same capabilities. You also had other implements, but that seemed to be the thing that probably Zacharias used. And he said his name is John. And then that's when Zacharias' mouth was open. So this is Luke 1, and I just wanted to cover it because uh, you have the supernatural elements of what's going on. Was Jesus truly born of the Virgin? Yes. That's what we believe. And out of all the different things, as people learn about the Bible and scholarship, and we had things called higher criticism, it's interesting because some of the scholars, I mentioned a man by the name of Bart Ehrman, and I don't recommend Bart Ehrman, okay? But some of the smart guys, they would, they would maybe at times say, there's other ways we can explain this. Like, in our day, this is how the thinking went. It's called higher criticism. They said, in our day, we're going to have to update the Bible, and all of the stories about miracles and things like that, some doubters began to say, maybe they just had spiritual meanings behind them. Now, yes, miracles, the feeding of the multitude and all, yes, there's spiritual meanings behind it, but the miracles that we read in the Gospels, as Christians, we believe are true miracles. But the one, out of all the others, some said, how did Jesus multiply the bread and fish? How could he have done it? And you've some have said, well, um, you know, there was really a lot of leftover food that day or things like that. No, if it says he did the miracle and multiplied the loaves and fishes, we believe that. But the one that some of the critics question the most is this one the virgin birth. Even some critics of the miracles would believe in the resurrection of Jesus and still question the virgin birth. Uh, and there's certain, there are reasons why people do it, but I will go on record in saying it's obvious from this text that it was a virgin because, uh, because in the Old Testament prophet of Isaiah, when it talks about a virgin shall conceive. In the Old Testament in Isaiah, it says, a virgin, behold, the Lord himself will give you a sign. I think it's Isaiah 6. And the virgin will conceive and bear a child. That's a prophecy hundreds of years earlier from the mouth of Isaiah, which I don't think he even knew what he was saying, but he was a prophet. Well, that's a famous prophecy. I will give you, the Lord himself will give you a sign. A virgin will conceive. Now, Old Testament is written in Hebrew. The word for virgin could also mean in Isaiah, not necessarily someone who never had sexual relations, but it could also refer to a particular uh, woman that not necessarily meant virgin the way we understand it. So some scholars would say, because you can interpret the passage in Isaiah. Now, the Old Testament's written in Hebrew, New Testament's written in Greek. So in Hebrew, difference in languages, it, it could have meant not necessarily virgin like we understand. So some would say maybe she wasn't completely virgin. But if you read the story we just discussed, what does Mary say to the angel? When the angel says, you're going to give birth and he's going to be the son of the highest and you will call his name Jesus. Yahweh is salvation. What does Mary respond? How can this be, seeing I quote, no, not a man? That language, no, not a man, meant knowing, meaning she was sexually with a man. So her response was, how am I going to get pregnant being I've never had sex? That was her response. So that's how we would interpret, most Christians, most teachers would interpret that no, it was talking about 
the virgin birth, the miraculous birth. And there are reasons why uh, Jesus was born a virgin, but it's clear in the text that that's what that is saying. And so that's what we believe as Christians, okay? Catholics and, quote, Orthodox Protestants believe in the virgin birth. And that was considered one of, and still considered one of the uh, tenets of the faith, okay? So we don't want to question it. We do take it by faith, and also we take it from the story as it's told. Okay? That's how we understand it, all right? So I went about 40 minutes and did a little review of... Any questions, Bethany? No, not that I can think of. Okay, let's see. I'll just look real quick. I kind of shared that one from that one example. There was a few others I could talk about that kind of came up, but I won't because I really want to get Luke 1. And the only corresponding uh, verse would have been Pastor Bill spoke of Malachi, and there's that prophecy from John the Baptist in Malachi, I think, chapter 4. And that'll be Okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you for letting us cover another uh, teaching, another Sunday sermon. I pray as the word goes out, like we were talking earlier in, on the video, that it would uh, be a blessing. It wouldn't just be something that we hear at once and try to get maybe something practical out of it, though we can get practical things, but let it be, let it have a, a impact and effect that would uh, be a good storehouse where people would remember the things that we talked about today, that it would stick in their hearts, and, and we pray a blessing on each person that watches this video. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And we end